This video is going to be on hemostasis. Now hemostasis, judging by the name, means stopping blood. In particular, stopping a bleeding blood vessel. And how we do that? Well, we'll just draw a blood vessel. When you have a blood vessel that's leaking out, we want to form a plug, a little clot. That's our goal. And at first, platelets come in and form this little plug that's draped by a protein called fibrinogen. So platelets plus fibrinogen. And that we call our primary hemostasis, our first, I guess our first line of defense, our first way to stop the bleeding. But that plug is very fragile. It can come apart at any time. So next thing we do, our clotting factors come in and turn this fibrinogen into a nice sturdy fibrin. And by doing that, it makes it a lot safer. And that is our secondary hemostasis. And the culmination of which is how we stop bleeding vessels. Uh, in this video, we're gonna talk about primary hemostasis first. So platelets and the fibrinogen that drapes over it. Let's recap what platelets are. Platelets are just fragments of megakaryocytes. So I'll just blow up a platelet make it very large. So fragments of megakaryocytes. And they have a lifespan of about a week, so seven to 10 days. And they spend a lot of that time in the spleen actually. So anytime you have a platelet problem, you might have splenomegaly. So they spend, spend a lot of time in the spleen. They're controlled, their production is controlled by a hormone called thrombo. Poetin. So kind of like EPO, but this time's thrombopoietin. And their job is to make that little plug. And so they see any damaged vessels and they activate. And they start to stick together, so they adhere. And they call their friends to come over. And so they aggregate. And that way they can form the plug and make our primary hemostasis. Let's look at the structure a little bit more in detail. At your surface, you have these proteins called glycoproteins. So glycoproteins. And those glycoproteins play a big role in activating, adhering, aggregating, etc. Inside your platelet or your thrombocyte, you have these granules. And there are a couple of different types of granules. You can have dense granules. And dense granules contain things like serotonin, ADP, and calcium. They look kind of like sacs, so an uh, easy way for me to remember is just SAC, sacs. Another type of granule you can have is alpha granule. An alpha granule contains von Willebrand factor. I'll tell you what that is in our coming videos, so just know von Willebrand factor. And fibrinogen. That's our drape. Yeah, that's what we're looking for. So it contains these in his granules. And then lastly, a very important part, um, you have your membrane. And your membrane, like a lot of other, other membranes, can undergo the arachnidonic pathway and make arachnidonic acids. In particular, it has something particular and special to your platelets and that's thromboxane synthase and thromboxane synthase judging by the name makes thromboxane especially thromboxane a2 now in normal situations when we don't have a when we don't have a break we have a nice intact endothelium we don't want just plugs to just form willy-nilly otherwise we get you know we get clots and thrombi and you know, MIs and stuff, we don't want that. So in normal situations, when we have an intact endothelium, your intact endothelium stops aggregation by releasing factors. Uh, factors including vasodilators to, to make your blood, blood vessels nice and wide so your platelets can't stick or adhere or aggregate. So vasodilators, these include things like nitric oxide. These include things like PGI2. That's a big one you should know, PGI2. That's one of the um, big vasodilators in the family. And then ADPase, which breaks down ADP. 
from our from our dense screens and I'll talk to you about what ADP does but just know we have things that basically stop our platelets from sticking in normal intact endothelium however if you don't have intact endothelium if you get a cut and the endothelium breaks then those factors decrease and it'll signal your body that it needs to form a clot. The first way it does that is by causing vasoconstriction. So that is the first step. And it can do that instinctively. Um, once, your, once your blood vessel gets a break, the nerves and the muscle of it will instinctively constrict. It can also release endothelin. That's a very, very powerful vasoconstrictor. It's actually what's responsible for um, pulmonary hypertension. So vasoconstrictor, and by constricting, then your platelets are able to, to kind of localize and aggregate and get closer to the break. So that's the first step. The second step, when you have a break, you expose the innards, basically the insides, to the outside. And your body sees that and says, that's not normal. You know, why, why am I seeing all these things? It shouldn't be. Things like collagen from the inside. So collagen, things like von Willebrand factor. Von Willebrand factor is found everywhere. It's found in basically all the players in the, in the game. So you have von Willebrand factor floating around in your plasma bound to um, factor eight that just stabilizes it. Factor eight. Uh, we said how von Willebrand's factors factor is found in your platelets. Now it's found in your endothelium. So it's found in your platelets. Endothelium plasma is found everywhere. So in your endothelium, it's found in these um, storage granules in your endothelium called Weibull palade bodies. And these are just storage granules in your endothelium. Um, they play a role in clotting. They also play a role in inflammation. They, they're what contain P-selectin. That's a uh, adhesion molecule that helps your neutrophils adhere and relieve your blood vessels. So that's a common question they like to ask. They'll talk about von, von Willebrand storage in your endothelium and they'll ask, what else does it store? It stores P-selectin. So von Willebrand factor is found everywhere. Why is it found everywhere? Because it's very important. Von Willebrand factor will bind to collagen, to the exposed collagen. So I'll write von Willebrand factor, von Willebrand factor. It binds to the exposed collagen. And when your platelets see that von Willebrand factor, it will start to stick to it. And your platelets will stick to it. Via the glycoproteins on its membrane. In particular, glycoprotein 1B. Glycoprotein 1B will stick to that von Willebrand factor. And when it does that, it activates the platelet. So I'll write activate platelet. Well, Willebrand sticks to GP1B. And when it activates the platelet, it becomes a star shape. So it goes from a sphere to kind of a star shape. And the star shape helps it kind of stack and stick together. And also when it turns into a star shape, it releases all its granules. So it releases all these granules. All right, release granules. So we have our dense granules releasing. We have serotonin, ADP, calcium. Um, what do these do? I found a very helpful memory aid on Khan's Academy, this is Khan's Academy video. It was past, present, future. So past serotonin would be the past. Serotonin causes vasoconstriction. We call it the past because vasoconstriction was a step, our first step, so kind of in the past. Present, ADP will be our present. ADP binds to ADP receptors and causes your playlist to express a glycoprotein, a glycoprotein called GP2B and 3A. And GP2B and 3A look for fibrinogen. So I'll start expressing these and look for fibrinogen, that drape we said that goes over it. Calcium will be your future. So calcium, we call it the future because it it has to deal with secondary hemostasis. That's our next topic. So past, present, future. 
your alpha granules will start to degranulate. So von Willebrand's factor, just because we need it to uh, stick more and adhere more. Fibrinogen, that's our drape. That's what we were waiting for the whole time. Fibrinogen will start to release. And then your membrane, your membrane will also release TXA2 and that just causes aggregation. And the same, uh, the same mechanism is due to expression of these receptors. So you have a ton of these receptors looking for fibrinogen. You release fibrinogen and now it's able to drape over our plug. And there, and there you have it. That's our primary hemostasis. That's our temporary plug. Now I want to finish this video by talking about pharmacology. So let's talk about some pharmacology. The easiest one is just aspirin. Aspirin is an NSAID. NSAID? 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 Do you call it NSAID or NSAID? I'll just call it NSAID. <laughs> so aspirin is an N... <laughs> I'm just going to call it aspirin. Aspirin uh, blocks the arachnidonic pathway. It's particular because it's irreversible. And because it's irreversible, if you want to reverse the effects of aspirin, you basically have to wait until your platelets die. So you have to wait seven to 10 days until you make new platelets and those platelets won't be affected by aspirin. So all right, irreversible. And because it blocks the arachnidonic uh, pathway, you get the anti-inflammatory um, effects of it. You also get the, you also get the anticoagulant effects of it because you block, you're blocking the formation of thromboxane A2. So that's how aspirin causes anticoagulation, blocks arachnidonic acid pathway. There are a ton of side effects, and I mean a ton. You can get gastric ulcers and bleeding because it maintains your mucosa. You can get renal problems because it's needed to maintain GFR. Uh, renal problems. You can have tinnitus. Uh, ringing in your ears because, because it's a metabolic change that just affects your ear. So um, overdoses you see ringing in the ear very commonly. Also causes Rye syndrome, that's liver failure in uh, kids, so you never give aspirin to kids. But it's a culmination of all the things we talked about in our previous blocks. Um, I always said a good way to ask um, aspirin questions is they'll talk about a person in chronic pain, so you just kind of infer they're taking NSAIDs. And now you can add a patient who needs to take anticoagulants for an extended period of time. So a patient that had an MI or had a previous heart surgery and needs to be on anticoagulants. Okay, so let's just throw that onto your list. That's aspirin, that's the, the mainstay. Something else we can give, we can give clopidogrel. Clopidogrel blocks ADP receptors. And if you block ADP receptors, then ADP can never bind and can never induce the, the I guess, the expression of GP2B and 3A. And because you can't make those receptors and you can't bind fibrinogen, you can't cause that drape. So that's how it works in um, stopping the formation of our plug. Now you can use this with aspirin together synergistically because they have two different mechanisms, or you can use it as an alternative to aspirin. So if, if the patient has an ulcer and you don't want to you know, make it worse or any of these side effects and you don't want to make it worse, then you can just give, so you can just give this drug instead of aspirin. Next up is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. And this increases CAMP in your platelets, that, and that causes it to not aggregate as well. It's also a direct vasodilator, so that also helps in stopping aggregation, so that's how it helps um, that way, as an antiplatelet. Now last but not least, A, B, C, Ixamab. It's not pronounced that way, I just like to write it that way because it's the easiest way for me to remember. A, B, C, Ixamab is a monoclonal antibody, that's why it's called a MAB, against your 2B3A receptor against the receptor itself. So I write against receptor for G23. This is very different from clopidogrel. Clopidogrel indirectly blocks glycoprotein 2 and 3 by blocking ADP. ABC Ixamab directly blocks glycoprotein 2 and 3. It has nothing to do with ADP. So that's your difference. You have to know that well. It's commonly asked. That's our primary hemostasis. In our next talk, we're going to talk about platelet disorders. Till then, thanks.